Okay, so, hypothetically speaking, in the first part of this video, the narrator talked too slowly, and people got bored. So, Springtime of Nations has brought in me, Ben Shapiro, to read the second half of this script, and potentially future videos as well. Let us know what you think in the comments of me reading this video. Thank you. In part one of this video, we discuss some general strategic lessons libertarians might learn from the Bolshevik movement's path to power in Russia. We also talked about the pitfalls of opportunism and adventurism, and made an analogy between the Bolsheviks' relationship with Russia's social democrats and libertarianism's relationship with elements of the American right. This week, I'd like to follow up with a few ideas about what American libertarians can do today. Okay, so before we can even think about strategy, we need to think about our win conditions. What do I mean by this? Well, if a time traveler came back from the future and told you that within your lifetime, a free society would be established, how would you guess that this happened? If your answer is that we voted in the most important election of our lifetimes and all the statists went home, then I, I hate to tell you, Mr. Hypothetical Opportunist, but you're probably wrong. As I mentioned in the last video, conservative politicians have been claiming that they'll make government smaller for decades, but have never done anything like that, despite winning plenty of elections. And granted, a lot of that is because they care more about their careers than about protecting liberty. But even the sincere ones have the deck stacked against them. If Ron Paul, for example, had won one of his presidential campaigns, that would have been fantastic, but it would not have automatically meant victory for us. Rather, it would have signaled the beginning of a brutal struggle, as every deep state bureaucrat did everything in their power to stop him from doing anything good. If you think the deep state went after Trump hard, imagine the absolute frenzy if instead of an easily manipulated boomer with some good instincts but no coherent ideology, they were faced with a libertarian dedicated to destroying their power and livelihoods. Things would escalate quickly. And while we can only speculate on the details, suffice to say that the ensuing power struggle would probably result in a complete reconstitution of the government as we know it. As Henry David Thoreau once said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. The system cannot be reformed. The state has a natural life cycle, which goes in one direction. It expands like a cancer until it either kills its host or is completely extinguished. If you're spending your time watching this video instead of TikTok dances, then you are the vanguard you are called to strike the root. In order to do this effectively, there are three conditions we must work to meet. First, existing tensions and polarization must be exacerbated and successfully framed as a struggle between liberty and authoritarianism. As the state expands its power, it will naturally rub up against the interests of many different groups. We have to attune our ears to the grievances of the people, which are varied and highly culturally contextual. From this, we can understand what issues are appropriate to emphasize when. For instance, right now, the two biggest issues in popular American politics are probably the COVID-19 lockdowns and the anti-police protests. Libertarianism has a position on both of these issues, against the lockdowns and against the police. Although these positions are associated with opposite sides of the conservative leftist dichotomy, libertarians should boldly and unapologetically insert ourselves into both, organizing protests and taking leadership positions whenever possible. In this way, we can harness the people's justified anger and guide it towards a holistic understanding of their enemy, our enemy. Leftists will certainly be hostile to attempts to frame the police protests as people versus government, because this will distract from their agenda of inciting racial conflict. Still, there are plenty of people who are aghast at police behavior, but simultaneously repelled by the leftists' overt disparagement of white Americans. As a general principle, Whenever there's tumult, the vanguard should move towards it, not away. Highly abstract economics and moral philosophy are important, but should be discussed mainly with people who have already agreed with us on one of the more topical issues. This is one of the most basic techniques in the psychology of persuasion, getting your foot in the door, building from common ground. One way I see people doing this wrong is being timid or overly deferential to ideological rivals when agreeing with them on some particular issue. Take the lead. It's our coalition. Fellow travelers are welcome to join, but we won't be offering concessions on principle. This will result in fierce denunciations, but these should be confidently ignored. And this bleeds into what I see as our second win condition, to secure for ourselves a place in the popular imagination as the main alternative to the system. When people think about how society might be restructured, they should think immediately of libertarianism. Even if they bitterly oppose this change, if we can get people to acknowledge that dichotomy, that's a win for us. Despite his incompetence, one thing Trump showed us during the 2016 election was the power of being the center of attention, even if that's negative attention. 
Conservatism fails because it defines itself as a reaction to what it's not, instead of a positive vision to be aspired to. If we can draw the open ire of the worst of the social democrats, and make them react to us specifically, anyone who has even a vaguely bad taste in their mouth about social justice will be drawn to us by default, and not to the haphazard pile of random positions and compromises that is conservatism. As I mentioned in my video on the election, when a state encounters serious problems, people start looking for alternatives. Eventually, there will come a time when people don't feel comfortable and safe, and when it does, we'll be there. And this brings me to our third win condition. We need to build disciplined organization and institutional power in preparation to assert ourselves in a moment of crisis. While doing everything possible to increase our numbers, we should not assume that we will reach a majority of the population. Radical ideologies normally don't until after they win, because most people tend to go along with the accepted dogmas of whatever society they're born into. That being said, there are many force multipliers we can use to build up our power, even with a small proportion of the population. First, we should work to implement an excellent idea that has already come from the libertarian movement, concentrating ourselves geographically. Plans like the Free State Project, which calls for at least 20,000 libertarians moving to the relatively less populated New Hampshire, could be game-changing if done successfully. When a crisis comes, we'll have a much better chance of carving out a small chunk of land than trying to get the whole vast empire on board with freedom. Moving to a different state is certainly a personal investment, but it can pay enormous dividends in freedom. We're already seeing some people leave certain states en masse, and with the rise of working from home, it's getting easier and easier. Libertarians rightfully prize their individuality, but when things start going south, you're going to need like-minded people to watch your back. But the work doesn't start in a crisis. It starts with a few libertarians making a commitment to get together on a regular basis and work together to do something. That something could be within established political channels, like a protest driven by a topical issue, putting up flyers or campaigning for a libertarian candidate. But it could also be a longer term investment, like teaching your comrades a skill. Are you knowledgeable about firearms? Give your fellow libertarians a gun safety class. Do you know the ins and outs of cryptocurrency? Show your friends how to invest. Direct action is good too. Find out about your local politicians and coordinate direct pressure. Multiple calls from different people in one day, politely telling them that you're concerned they aren't doing enough on libertarian issues, can be powerful. The point of this isn't to change a politician's mind. Assume that you can't. The point is to make libertarianism loom over politics like a shadow, something politicians are thinking about and talking about. Even if they don't actually do anything different, if they publicly pay us lip service or attack us, that's a victory. Because now you've helped solidify libertarianism as an idea on the table in the minds of regular people watching. There's a libertarian on the candidate, and listen, I, I love libertarians. I got elected with the support of a great many libertarians throughout the state of Texas. And I'll tell you, if you're a libertarian, let me speak to you directly. I'm sure many of us have heard the saying that first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they attack you, then you win. Well, that's very true, and it's tapping into something I'm talking about here. If we can move ourselves up on that list towards being attacked instead of ignored or laughed at, that's a win. Ultimately, what you specifically do is less important than the fact that you're working together with other libertarians. Well-functioning teams don't just instantly come together, as anyone who's been on one can tell you. People take time to get used to working together before they hit their stride and become really effective. In part one, I talked about how the February government was forced to rely on Bolsheviks to fight off Kornilov's coup in 1917, even though the Bolsheviks were fewer in number. Why was that? Because the Bolsheviks had practice, not military experience, but practice working as a team. They had already been running trade unions and the Petrograd Soviet like an army, so when the time came, all they needed were the guns. So now let's talk about voting. As I've said before, we should do it. And more than that, I think there's a specific way we should do it in order to be most effective, which I'd like to propose now. If we think back to our three win conditions, we'll find that voting can serve all three. By creating a highly visible, strategic-minded block of libertarian voters, we can certainly frame existing issues as liberty versus authoritarianism. That's win condition one. Since most people think about politics primarily through the lens of elections, voting also helps portray libertarianism as the main alternative, or at least an alternative, to the system. That's win condition two. And finally, get out the vote efforts are textbook community organizing, which is building institutional power. That's win condition three. So how should we vote strategically? Here's a flowchart I made. First, look to vote in primaries. They are probably more important than general election races, because the greater number of candidates increases the likelihood that one of them will be libertarian aligned. This is most often going to be the Republican primary, 
But if you happen to live in a rare district with a libertarian leaning or fellow traveler Democrat, vote for them. In most states, you have to register with the party in order to vote in a primary. So do that. The threshold of how libertarian a candidate has to be to earn our votes in a primary should be significantly lower than in a general election. Remember, in a primary, your vote is not necessarily endorsing that person actually taking office. You just want them to be the one in the limelight for the general election. This is normally going to be because they bring more attention to us and our issues, or even one of our issues, even if they don't pass a litmus test. Speaking of a litmus test, in a general election we should be a little more stringent with our voting criteria, because it's here we really have the opportunity to cause some major butthurt if we don't vote or vote LP. We like butthurt. Butthurt is good. It gives us relevance. So this being said, when do we vote for a major party nominee? Basically when they're libertarian. But how do we know when they're libertarian? Well, here's a simple test. Are they pro-ending the wars? Are they pro-gun rights? Are they for legalizing drugs? Are they for lowering taxes? I didn't pick these issues particularly because they're the most important issues necessarily. Some of them are more important than others. I picked them because really what we're trying to do here is get beneath the surface rhetoric and sniff out who's really one of us. And it's pretty rare for someone to hold this combination of correct positions and not basically be a libertarian. They don't have to publicly talk about legalizing heroin right now. That would be career suicide. But by this point, there are plenty of Republican politicians who are openly pro-legalizing marijuana. So if they can't even support that, it's a definite no-go. Not because dude weed is the most important thing, but because of what it says about them that they won't support something so correct, even now that it's so popular. In the future, when marijuana is totally legal, the next litmus test should probably be their attitude towards decriminalizing magic mushrooms, since that seems to be what's happening next, a la Oregon. Now, when the election is for county dog catcher, you might not be able to find their positions on these issues. So you'll have to use what knowledge is available. How are they framing their campaign? If the election is for sheriff, and the Republican says we need to be tough on crime, and the Democrat says we need police reform, you should probably vote for the Democrat. Use your best judgment, but absolutely do not be afraid to vote for neither candidate. That's usually how it's gonna go. It won't often happen that you get a major party nominee who passes the litmus test. But when it does, it's normally better to vote for them than voting LP. This is because the better libertarian candidates do in the major parties, the more attention the libertarian movement will get from the media, which ultimately translates to more power and leverage. So that brings me to our second choice, which is available much more often, voting LP. Unless the candidate is just a blatant entryist who substantially deviates from libertarian principle in terms of their actual policies, it doesn't really matter who they are. They're not usually going to win anyway. We're voting for the party, not the person. If we create a spoiler effect by getting enough votes that it could have swung the election's outcome, that's all the better. The losing major party will wail and gnash their teeth about how we should have voted for them. And by voting LP, we've sent them a strong message which might influence their policy emphases next time around. A politician on the fence about legalizing marijuana, for instance, will see that if they don't align with libertarians, there will be consequences. Oh, did we spoil the election for you? Maybe you should have thought about that. In a presidential election, we should almost always vote LP. Any party that crosses the threshold of 5% of the vote in a presidential election receives funding from the Federal Election Committee. Is it hypocritical for us to seek this? Absolutely not. This money comes exclusively from voluntary contributions on the part of taxpayers, not stolen money. The benefits of this extra funding would be substantial. Every dollar gives us more advertising, more organization, and more infrastructure, and therefore, more power, more leverage, and more relevance. Because the LP receives many fewer votes than the major parties, each single vote it receives constitutes a much bigger percentage of the total. You might consider Trump better than Joe Biden, but if you had voted for Joe Jorgensen, your vote would be in this sense about 70 times more impactful. We almost reached the 5% threshold in 2016, when the major party candidates were both extremely unpopular. Unfortunately, Gary Johnson wasn't the best suited to exploit this opportunity. I am fine. I'm as well. But you're damn right I voted for him anyway. That's strategic discipline. In any case, if there's no libertarian candidate running on a major party ticket, and no LP candidate on the ballot, we should still register to vote, but not actually vote. This lowers the voter participation rate, which helps to delegitimize the state. Or, if there's another election you should vote in on the same ballot, you can simply write in Count Chocula or your favorite breakfast cereal mascot. This decreases the percentage of the vote the winner will get, while also making it more likely that your vote is counted as opposed to a ballot with a blank section. Winning with a low percentage can then be used to attack and delegitimize that politician later. 
What we should not do is vote for the lesser of two evils. That's giving away your leverage and encouraging bad behavior. A lot of libertarians are concerned that if the LP focuses too heavily on getting as many votes as possible, it will become ideologically diluted. And this is certainly a valid concern. That's why the work of groups like the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus is so valuable. Ideology works like a pyramid. The boldest and most radical in a movement are enabled by the passive support of a much larger base of less committed sympathizers. Take the rise of Antifa, for example. Antifa is a decentralized, revolutionary communist movement which advocates violent direct action against political opponents. The term has its origins in the paramilitary wing of the German Communist Party during the Weimar Republic, although the label and tactics were later adapted by Western European communists in the 80s and 90s. However, in the US, it emerged quickly and seemingly out of nowhere in the aftermath of the 2016 election. Where did they come from? Well, mostly from the ranks of the democratic socialist movement rapidly grown by Bernie Sanders. Sanders took a lot of impressionable young people and introduced them to socialism. And then a fraction of these people became more radical and started throwing bricks. That didn't happen on its own. These people were guided in their intellectual development by a vanguard of more dedicated, more disciplined, and more radical communists who led them from their original impetus of hating Trump and supporting Sanders to more revolutionary thought. A 2014 Pew survey found that 14% of Americans self-identified as libertarians, while an earlier Gallup survey found that number to be as high as 23%. These numbers are not evenly distributed across the U.S. either. They're going to be higher in some areas, especially if we all start moving together like we should. Of course, many of these people won't exactly know what it means to be a libertarian, but that's okay. People decide who to support based on general concepts and a political identity they've accepted, not based on a bunch of specific policies. Polling has also found that most Americans say they support a smaller government with fewer services and lower taxes, as opposed to a larger government with more services and higher taxes. This is even true of millennials when you explicitly mention the taxes. The people have the right general instincts. Now it's up to us to show them the way. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and this two-part series, please give this video a like so that other people are more likely to see it. Also, let us know in the comments some ideas you have for things you could do with a small group of like-minded individuals. I'll be back next week with another video, so remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss it. Until then, peace to you and yours.